Okay, good morning, church. Good morning, South Point. How are we doing today? Yeah, morning. Good, good. You guys are lively. Um, I, I like that this morning. I like that. It's great. Hey, I'm excited to be here with you today. I'm really excited. I mean, Sunday is my favorite day. Uh, it's my favorite day of the week because it's the day that I get to come here and I get to be here with, with you guys and share this day with you. And so truly, this is one of my favorite parts of, of the week. And I'm really excited about this series that we're doing called Aftermath. And we are, we're looking at what, what happened after the resurrection, what happened after Jesus uh, died and, and rose and then ascended to heaven, what was it that came next? And before we really get into that, it's so important that we do something, that we set the story straight. Do we need to know who we are as a church and we need to know what it is that we believe? So whether you've been here for 500 Sundays and for 100 years or whether this is your very first Sunday, there's something that you need to know and there's something that is so critically important and it's something that we often get wrong. And it's this, that the foundation of our faith is actually the resurrection. So the foundation of our faith is the resurrection. And Karina's going to throw that slide up for you guys. And it's important that we know this, that our faith is founded on the resurrection and the resurrection alone. See, without the resurrection, Jesus was nothing more than just a rabbi. He was nothing more than just a teacher. Without the resurrection, Jesus was nothing more than just a clever guy that could tell stories and that could convince people to follow him. Without the resurrection, Jesus was nothing more than just another person crucified by the Romans. See, it's the resurrection that sets Jesus apart. And it's the resurrection that we find the foundation of our faith. Now, I know that you may be sitting there thinking, well, what about the Bible? Okay, that's very valid. So I, I've got something for you here. The Bible is the authority that we live by, but the resurrection is the foundation for all that we believe. So it's important to understand the distinction between the two. Now, we're not taking anything away from the Bible. I mean, God, before someone throws a Bible at me up here, I do have one up here. It is valuable to me. It is important, and we're going to go through a ton of scripture today, so nobody send any emails. But the, the Bible is, our, is, is an authority for us. It's God's Word. It's a living, breathing representation of the Word of God. But the Bible is not what created Christianity. See, Christianity actually was, was a movement that came because of the resurrection of Jesus, and because of that movement, the Bible was put together and formed and given to us. So it's important that we get that straight, but it's important that we understand that the Bible is the authority we live under, but the resurrection is the foundation for everything that we believe. So let me ask you this. Why is this important to us? Why is this important to us as a church? Why is it important to me? So it's important to me because not everybody out there knows this. There's too many people out there that don't know this to be true. Now, if you look around in the room right now, there's some empty chairs. And every empty chair that I see when I stand up here on a Sunday morning, my heart breaks for it. Because every empty chair that I see out there is a potential that somebody out there in the four and a half, five million people that live in this city are not in here or not in church somewhere getting an opportunity to have an intersection with the love of God. Every empty chair in this room breaks my heart every single Sunday. And it... And that's the kind of church that we are. And why are we that? Because our faith is founded on the resurrection of Jesus. You know, th this week, Casey and I had a bit of a, a traumatic encounter on Friday night. Um, Friday night, we ended up in the pediatric ward with, with Wyatt. Wyatt had to be rushed in for a, an emergency surgery. And he's okay now. Wyatt's our, our 10-day-old. And so we were rushed in. We, ru we rush in at like 7, 7.30. We end up in the, the ER there, the pediatric ward, and the surgeon is meeting us there. And while Wyatt is sitting in the, in the room, and we're not there, but we can hear him cry. And as Casey's sitting on the bench or on the couch, and they were so good at, at the hospital there, but as Casey's sitting there, I'm pacing, you know, up and down the floorway, just pacing, pacing, pacing. And I can hear other kids cry. You know, Casey said something that the maternity ward is where happiness happens because that's where babies are born. The pediatric ward, that's a hard place. That's a tough place. And as I'm listening to these other babies cry and as I'm watching other parents come and go, I just think to myself, I'm so happy and so privileged that I don't have to do this without Jesus. 
I'm so happy and I'm so privileged that because of the resurrection, not because of a Bible verse that I read, but because of the truth that came out of the resurrection, when I send a prayer request out to people, I know that there's power behind that prayer. And I know that we are covered in prayer and we're going to be okay. I know that I can stand in that pediatric ward and stand there in confidence, knowing that Jesus Christ has our back. Why? Because of the power of the resurrection. And that, again, is why every chair that's empty in here is a broken burden in me. Because there's too many people that sit in a pediatric ward. There's too many people that sit in a hospital or, or in a job or in depression or anxiety or whatever it is. And they have not had an encounter with a resurrected Lord. And so what I want us to be as a church is I want us to be a church that's aggressive at filling seats. Not because we can have big numbers, but because every seat filled is a person that gets an opportunity to encounter Jesus. It's a person that doesn't have to do life without hope. It's a person that doesn't have to do things alone. See, there's our life, and that it's the life that we have and that we're given and that we live, but we get this opportunity to have an encounter with the resurrected Jesus. And today we're going to look at a guy who completely changed. The resurrection completely changed him. And I'm going to take you through his story. And so I, I want us to put our, ourselves in his shoes and to walk in his feet and to understand what it was like to, to go from before the resurrection to then having this encounter with Jesus and, and witnessing with his own eyes the resurrection and how that changes his life after that. So we're going to be looking at Peter's journey today. And I've got a, a lot of scripture that we're going to go through today. And I'm not going to break it all down, but it's a story. And, and by story, I mean this is a real event. It's an actual event. But, but we're gonna, I'm going to take you through it in a way that I hope you can identify with it along the way. And so Peter, he's one of the, the 12 disciples. Peter is the guy that would, that would go on to, to be called the rock. And, and that Jesus would say, we're going to build our church on you. Peter's a guy that we all know. He's written several books in the New Testament, but that's the Peter that we're looking at today. It's, it's the one that was a disciple of Jesus. That meant that he was with Jesus throughout Jesus' entire ministry. And so when we look at the story of Peter, we're going to be looking at a difference that happens between Passover to Pentecost. See, in, in Passover, about seven weeks prior to the date that we're going to be talking about, there was this, this holiday that happened in Jerusalem, and it was called Passover, the celebration of Passover. And that is when Jesus entered into the city, and Jesus had the, the meal in the upper room, and Jesus had all his disciples around, and then Jesus was betrayed by Judas, and he was given over to the temple court and the temple guards, and then uh, they convinced Pilate to hang him on the cross, and he was crucified. That happened on Passover. The reason that they then would go and break the legs of the people on the cross is because they had to get them down because the Passover celebration was about to start. See, they had to get the, the, the Savior of the world off the cross because they had a religion to celebrate the next day. And so that's Passover. Seven weeks after that happens, Jerusalem is filled once again with people. And people have come, probably a lot of the same people that were there during Passover have come back for this celebration called Pentecost. Pentecost is one of the three major Jewish holidays. And, and see, because it was a major Jewish celebration, all of the, the, the Jewish people had gathered back to Jerusalem. And so here you have again, seven weeks later, you've got a large number of the same people that were chanting, put Jesus on the cross, are back in Jerusalem. And they're back there, and they're celebrating another Jewish holiday called Pentecost. And, and that's where we're going to pick up our story. Now, to give you a little bit of background on this, we're going to be in the book of Acts. Acts was written by, uh, by a guy named Luke. Luke was one of the disciples. Luke, uh, when he wrote Acts, he put a ton of research into it. So Luke actually went out, and he gathered testimony. He gathered testimony from different people. He gathered testimony from eyewitness accounts. Luke had his own eyewitness accounts, and he put together the book of Acts. And the book of Acts largely tells the story of the 30 years after the resurrection of Jesus. And it kind of tells us the story of the birth of the church. And so Peter, from Passover, was, was hiding. So when Jesus was put on the cross, Peter denied Jesus three times. 
And then after Jesus died, Peter thought, well, Jesus is dead. Everything that we stand for is also dead with it. And so Peter went from denying Jesus three times once to a little girl, by the way. And then he went to hiding in a room behind a locked door. That, that's how strong Peter's faith was. That, that's, that's the kind of person that Peter was. That was the character that he had. Nothing. He was terrified. He was scared. He was hopeless. And he assumed that all that Jesus stood for was gone. And so now seven weeks later, we find ourselves at Pentecost. And we find ourselves in the book of Acts. And we're going to look here at chapter 2. And I'm going to begin to take you through Peter's experience. And so when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. So it's just like I said, that means that everybody was together. And by all, it was like all the Jews were together. And then also all the disciples were together and they were in the upper room. And the disciples had replaced Judas. So they replaced him with a guy named Matthias. And they're all there and there's probably about 100 of them. So think about 100 kind of followers of Jesus or disciples, and they've gathered in this place for Pentecost, and they're in the upper room. And while they're there, suddenly a sound came from heaven like a rushing, violent wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Now, they didn't know that this was coming. Just imagine that you're sitting there, and all of a sudden you hear this this rushing sound from heaven, and, and it just completely fills the room. And what was happening in this moment is something that Jesus had promised was coming true, that Jesus was sending the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit would end up falling on everyone in the room. And what that means, for those of you that don't understand that, that's okay. Think of the Holy Spirit like a helper. See, Jesus loves us so much, and God loves us so much, that before Jesus ascended to heaven, he actually told the disciples and he told a crowd of people, hey, I'm going to go. You don't need me to stay here because actually when I go, I'm going to give you something better. I'm going to give you something better than my physical presence. I'm going to give you this thing called the Holy Spirit. It's going to be your helper. It's going to be your advocate. And so Jesus promises this thing to come to everyone, to come to the disciples. And on this, in this moment, on Pentecost, this happens. And because this has happened at, at, on the day of Pentecost, there's a ton of people in the city Everyone is gathered. And when a giant rushing wind and a a noise comes through the upper room, it also disturbs everybody around them. And see, what happens from this is is there's this incredible reaction. And we find that in the next verse, in verse 6. And when the sound was heard, a crowd gathered. Obviously, right? It's like when when I'm sitting in my house and I hear something in the street, you know, I want to see what it is. People are naturally curious. So this is a real life event. Something happened. A sound was heard. Those that were in the room encountered the Holy Spirit, but those that were outside the room, well, they didn't know what it was or what was going on, so they went to look. And so a crowd gathered, and they were bewildered because each one was hearing those in the upper room speaking in his own language or dialect. They were completely astonished, saying, Look, are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears in our own language or our native dialect? So here's what was happening to them. Let me just explain this to you. So up in the upper room was Galileans. It was, it was Jesus' followers. Think of them as like very simple people. It's kind of like me. You know, I stand up here in front of you guys with a slightly southern uh, accent, and I'm just amazed that you guys can understand me every Sunday. But imagine it as I stand up here speaking to you. I'm speaking in my Southern American English. But if you're Afrikaans, you're hearing me in Afrikaans. If you're Kosa, you're hearing me in Kosa. If you're uh, proper English, then you're hearing me in proper English with a proper accent. But that's what is happening. As people were walking by and they were hearing who they knew to be a Galilean, they were hearing them talk, but they could hear it in their own language and they were astonished by it. And they were, they were wondering, how can this be? What, what exactly is happening? So that, that's why they're asking this question of, of how can this be? And then in verse 13, it's like th- this is actually kind of funny here. But others were laughing and joking and ridiculing them, saying they're full of sweet wine and they are drunk. So this is, this is a real thing. You, you've got a perfect situation where something amazing is happening in the upper room. 
People are walking by, a crowd is gathered, half the people are astonished and amazed, and the other half of the people are saying, no, they're just drunk. I mean, this sounds like Twitter or the internet or Facebook. This is a perfect situation. I could see the Pinelands 531 Facebook page just, yeah, I hear some amens there. I know I hit a local note with, with that one. But, but so the, everyone's debating, you know, they're drunk. No, this is something amazing. No, they're drunk. This is something amazing. And something even more incredible happens. This guy, Peter, this guy, Peter, who was hiding because of Jesus before. Jesus here, or Peter hears these people saying, hey, they're drunk. They're drunk. And Peter says, no, 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 no. I'm going to stand up for what's happening here. I'm going to explain it. And so Peter jumps in on the next verse. But Peter, standing with the eleven, he raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea, so he's addressing everyone that can hear him. Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be explained to you. So Peter's like, we're not drunk. I'm going to explain it to you. And he gets very literal here. He says, listen closely and pay attention to what I have to say. These people are not drunk, as you assume, since it's only 9 a.m. in the morning. So Peter is saying, guys, let's first just have a little bit of common sense here. Now, I know there's a few of you out there that like to have a breakfast beer. But apparently, at the time, Peter's saying, guys, it's 9 a.m. There's no way that these people are drunk. So you need to first just apply a little bit of logic to it. And I don't know if maybe Peter was nervous, because Peter knew what was happening. But maybe he thought, let me test the waters first. Let me start with something logical. Let me tell people something that, okay, it, it, they can't be drunk because it's 9 a.m. I'm going to speak and appeal to the mind first. But then Peter goes on to appeal to the spirit. And he does that in this next verse, in verse 22. He says, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man accredited and appointed out, attested to you by God. So he's saying, Jesus, who God chose. With the power to perform miracles and wonders and signs, which God worked through him in your very midst, just as you yourself know, this man, when handed over to the Roman authorities according to the predetermined decision and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross and put to death. So what Peter's doing here is Peter's explaining all those words are to do one thing and one thing only. Peter is saying, this is not happening because of something that your mind can understand through logic. This is happening because Jesus of Nazareth, he's reminding them where Jesus came from. Jesus of Nazareth, who is appointed by God, who did miracles in your midst, meaning you've seen Jesus work. You've seen Jesus do a miracle, so don't be surprised at what you see here. He's the one that's done this. And then Peter goes on to remind them, you nailed Jesus to a cross and put him to death. So now Peter is stepping out with boldness. You put Jesus on the cross. That's the Jesus that we're doing this by, by the one that you nailed on the cross. And you did it by the hands of lawless and godless men. But God raised him up, releasing him and bringing it into the agony of death. God raised this Jesus bodily from the dead. And all of that fact, we are all witnesses. So what Peter is telling them is the Jesus that is providing this miracle that you guys have gathered to see is the Jesus that you put on the cross. And he's the Jesus, most importantly, this is our, 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 one of our great references to the resurrection. Peter is saying, we all witnessed this man raise himself from the dead. You know, what's amazing to me is th this is Peter's first sermon. So the first sermon that Peter preaches, post-resurrection. And what's amazing is that this sermon was not what Jesus taught. It wasn't about what Jesus taught, but it was on the eyewitness account of the resurrection. So Peter, the first thing that he preaches, post-resurrection, it's not a Bible verse. It's not a quote from the Old Testament. First, he gets the story straight on who Jesus is. And then he says, this comes down to the fact that we watch this man resurrect. And so after Peter does this and, and he talks through the crowd, just imagine Peter going from someone that denied Jesus and hid in a room to now he's pretty boldly calling the, 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 the people out for what they did when they put Jesus on the cross. And so after he does this, he gets a reaction. He gets a reaction from the crowd. And their reaction is, is this here. 
Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Cut to the heart. I mean, they were deeply, deeply affected by, by this. They were deeply impacted by the words that Peter said. So they were cut to heart with remorse and anxiety. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what is it that we are to do? And so Peter says back to them, he says to repent, which by repent, he means change the way that you think about Jesus. It's that simple. Change the way you think about Jesus. And then be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ because of the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So what Peter does here is he says, I know you feel bad. And so here's what you can do about it. Here's practical application for you. You can change the way you think about Jesus. And when you change the way you think about Jesus, you can get baptized, meaning you can take a public declaration of your faith. You can, you can say publicly, I'm changing the way I think about Jesus here. So I think that this is a pretty successful first sermon for Peter. I think this is pretty good for a guy who went from denying Jesus and hiding in a room to now com- confronting people boldly. And getting a response out of them that they feel convicted. That they feel just cut to the heart. And they say, okay, we need to know what to do next. We need Jesus. And so now Peter, who's got John with him. John is is, is doing all of this with Peter. After this happens, Peter's he's now walking with some pep in his step. I mean, he feels like, you know, now he's made of brass a little bit. Like he can be even bolder. And so Peter and John, they decide they're going to go back to the temple. The temple is the last place that they should go because the temple holds the people in it that convicted Jesus and uh, eventually convinced Pilate to put him on the cross. But Peter and John, they go straight to the temple. Remember, before Peter fled from the temple, he hid from the temple. And there's this amazing story in in Acts chapter 3, and we're not going to to read it here, but I, I wanted to put this up here so that you could look at it for yourself or you could look it up later at home. But Peter and John are walking into the temple, and as they're walking into the temple, they're probably giving each other a fist bump and a high five. They're walking with their chest out. You know, they're excited. Jesus has done this thing. They've got the Holy Spirit in them. Peter just preached his first sermon, and it wasn't like a bomb. People just didn't sit there and stare at him like you guys do to me sometimes. You know, they, they responded, they reacted in this amazing way. And so Peter and John are walking into the temple, and as they walk into the temple... There's this, there's this lame beggar that everyone knew, and he's sitting there off to the side, and he asks him for some money. And so what Peter says is, well, I don't have any money to give you, but I'll tell you what, I'll heal you. And, and so Peter reaches down, he picks him up, and at that moment, his ankles and his feet became strong, his legs became strong, and he could stand on his own weight. And this man not only walks off, but he starts jumping and dancing and following Peter. Now, everyone knew that, that this man was lame. This was not like a a stranger. This is somebody that had been there over and over and over and over and over again. And now they're seeing this guy stand up and and dance around. And a crowd gathers. So as this crowd gathers, because this amazing thing has happened, this crazy thing has happened, Peter is going to get another chance at a sermon. So here this guy is, another chance to preach. I mean, he's on a roll here. And so we're going to get into Peter's sermon. So in in Acts chapter 3, Peter's got a crowd around him. And this crowd has gathered because they've just watched Peter heal this guy. And so Peter addresses them and he says, The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. But you disowned and denied the Holy Spirit and righteous one and asked for the pardon of a murderer to be granted to you. I mean, Peter's on another great sermon roll here. What if I stood in front of you guys and just said, hey, your sins were horrible this week. You are the one that convicted Jesus and put Jesus on the cross. Or, you know, that, that's essentially what Peter's doing, looking at these guys and completely calling them out. And it's interesting that he starts this thing off by talking about, you know, Abraham and their forefathers. He's saying, hey, I know that you're struggling to believe Jesus, but I know that based on your Jewish tradition that you believe in Abraham, that you believe in Jacob. And so, hey, just so you know, from that line, from that lineage, that's where Jesus comes from. And so Peter goes on here and says, but you killed the prince of life. Which is a strong statement. You killed the prince of life. 
whom God raised from the dead. And to this fact, and here he is again, Peter is saying this incredibly important thing. To this fact, we are witnesses, for we have seen the risen Christ. So we've watched something that Peter is now so boldly proclaiming that he has seen Jesus resurrect from the dead. And we're watching that Peter goes from hiding in the shadows to shining a light of truth. Peter's no longer hiding behind a locked door and denying that he knows Jesus. Peter is now in the middle of the temple, in the middle of the worst place that he could be as a Christ follower, and he is boldly proclaiming who put Jesus on the cross. And he's boldly proclaiming that because of God, Jesus resurrected. These are bold statements. Peter is now taking the truth and shining it in one of the darkest places that there are. And so what happens after this, and remember, there's a crowd gathered. And Peter's just just calling these people out, just cracking a whip on them, calling them out for their sins. And there's all this commotion. There's all these people that are gathered. And so the next thing that happens is the priests, the priests and the captain of the temple guard uh, and the Sadducees, they came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. Now, these are the same people. Caiaphas is in this as well. These are the exact same people that arrested Jesus and that put Jesus on the cross. These are the same people that Peter hid from. These are the same people that Peter denied Jesus because of. They were terrified that these people were going to come and do the same thing to them. The reason that Peter and the disciples were hiding behind a locked door after Jesus died was they were afraid that these people would show up. But because Peter has had an encounter with the resurrection... He is now boldly right in the middle of their temple. And so they seize him. Peter gets arrested. And so in verse 3, we go on here to read. They seize Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. So Peter and John are now put in jail. So now they're in the place, and they're thinking, okay, is this it? Are we dead? Is this the end of us? And then we pick up in verse 7. They had Peter and John brought before them, and they began to question them. So now the Sanhedrin. The, the temple court, the people that Peter and John should not want to be around, bring Peter and John forward, and they say, by what power or what name did you do this? See, these guys were always worried about what authority somebody was, was speaking on or preaching on or teaching on because they were so insecure about their authority that it was obvious that they were going to question anyone else's authority. And so Peter answers, and he says this. Then Peter, he says, Rulers and elders of the people. This guy is bold now at this point. If we are being called to account today for an act of kindness. So Peter's saying, are you calling us to account for an act of kindness? Because the guy that had been healed was in the crowd. He was a part of this this hearing. So the miracle's standing right there. And Peter's like, oh, are, are we here in front of you because of this guy? Because something kind happened? You have, a, you have a problem with that? And so the man who was lame was being asked how he was healed. And then know this. So this is Peter continuing on. You and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So Peter is now setting, this is how we did what we did. So by the name of Jesus, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you completely healed. And then The story goes on from here, and it says that when they saw the courage of Peter and John, they realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, and they were astonished, and they took note that these men had actually been with Jesus. So Peter and John end up getting released, but there's something important here, and it's when you lose your fear of death, then there is nothing in life that you can be afraid of. And Peter and John had lost their fear of death. And the reason that they lost their fear of death is because they physically witnessed with their own eyes a resurrected Jesus who defied death. And when they finally grasped this idea that they served a God that was not bound by death, they lost their fear of death. And with their fear of death lost, they're afraid of nothing. And so now Peter and John, they're they're given their freedom and they go out. But guess what? They decide that they're going to they're gonna speak to people. And they're going to tell the Sanhedrin that, that they will not be hushed. And so in verse 15, 
that they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin, meaning Peter and John are there, and the Sanhedrin are, are, are trying to figure out what to do with them. And then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to listen to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help but speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. And so now Peter and John have said, we're not going to do what you tell us to do. You're trying to hush us and we're just not going to do it. And so they get released on this. And you would think that after being released that Peter and John would move on with their lives and they would maybe go somewhere else, but they don't. They go right back to the temple. And so Peter goes to the temple, and guess what happens? Duh, he gets arrested again because he's doing exactly what he was told not to do. It's like at some point, is he bold or is he stubborn or is he ignorant? Or maybe because he was covered by the love of Jesus, he was none of those things and none of those things mattered. And so Peter gets arrested again. And now in this arrest, the, the apostles, they're brought in. And we, we look at the verse here. The apostles are brought in, and they're made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. That's Caiaphas. Caiaphas is the guy that has the authority to have them crucified. And so he says to Peter, he says, We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. He said, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. So Peter was influencing an entire city now. And Caiaphas and the temple, they're feeling threatened. And they're feeling like Peter is going to do the thing that they were afraid Jesus was going to do. He's going to raise up the crowd against them. Everything they stand for is now threatened. They thought when they nailed Jesus to the cross that the story was over, but it's not over because the resurrection happened. And when the resurrection happened, it took what happened on the cross and it made it a precursor. And now Caiaphas is still dealing with what Jesus did because there was a resurrection. And so, but after they say this, Peter and the apostles, they respond. And so Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than other humans. And then in verse 30, he goes on to tell them, The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on the cross. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit. There's that word, witnesses, again. And so the Sanhedrin, they pause to determine the fate of Peter and John. Peter and John are now arrested. They're in jail the Sanhedrin, which are the people that have the ability to crucify Peter. They're, they're, they've gone aside to figure out what to do. Can you see the transformation in this guy, Peter? Can you see how he went from this bold person to now becoming, or how he went from this scared person to now becoming this incredibly bold person? What was the difference in Peter? It wasn't his knowledge of, of Scripture or the Old Testament. It was his experience with the resurrection. That was the thing that made it different. And so the story goes on, and we'll move through it quickly, because I, I want to get to the end of this. I've got something amazing for you at the end. But the, the Sanhedrin, they go to this, this wise guy, Gamaliel. And so this guy says, you know what, just let him go. We don't need another martyr here. We just need to let this pass. Just, just you know, don't be the squeaky wheel. Put a little grease on it and let it go, and it'll just steam itself out, and don't worry about it. But they decided that they couldn't do that. So instead, they had them flogged. And then they, were, they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and then they let them go. And so in verse 41, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing. Now, if you don't know what being flogged is, see, in, in this time... People did not have a criminal record. There wasn't a database. There wasn't something where you could pull up an ID number and see everything that these people had done uh, wrong or right. There were no warrants for people's arrests. There wasn't any of that. So instead, what they did is they physically marked you. If you were arrested, if you were a criminal, you were physically marked. And they physically marked you by flogging you, by beating you with whips, with glass in it. And they beat you in the back. And so after being flogged, they've been marked as criminals. They've been marked as unworthy. They've been marked as shameful people. And they walk out of there with those marks on their back. And they rejoice because they've been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name of Jesus. Now, why do they say disgrace? 
Because according to culture, when you're flogged, you are looked on poorly because you've obviously done something incredibly wrong. Now, Luke, as he's writing the book of Acts, I think he gets tired of writing all these little stories over and over and over again. So Luke just sums the whole thing up here in verse 42, and he says this, day after day. So they just keep doing this. In the temple courts and from house to house, they never stop teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. They just never stopped. Now, what, why, why have I taken all this time to take you through all this scripture? Because the thing that matters the most is that everything that happens depends on the resurrection. And here you have Peter, who's about to start the church, who's igniting the church for, for the people in Jerusalem and then for the people in the rest of the world. And Peter is changed and he's made different because of an encounter that he has with the resurrection. And so we want to see the same amazing thing that happened to Peter happen in your life. See, what I want to do is I want to equip you and equip other people with an endurable, defensible, unassailable version of faith. Wouldn't it be amazing if you had that? If you walked out of this room or you walked into your Monday morning and you had an endurable faith, meaning nothing could tire your faith out. No amount of flogging, no amount of jail time, no amount of being doubted, no amount of, of Sanhedrins or trials. I mean, sometimes, do you ever feel like when you walk into work on Monday morning, you're stepping into a trial and you're on the hot seat? Or do you ever feel like you walk into your home, into your marriage, and you're stepping right into a trial and you're on the hot seat there? We want to equip you with something that's endurable, that, that can't be tired out. We want to give you something that's defensible so that your faith can always be defended. You know, this is why it's so great that this truth doesn't hinge on, on arguments and things that are in the Bible. Remember, the Bible is the authority that we live under, but it's not the foundation of our faith. Because, you know, there's, there's so many smart people out there that can, that can argue against the Bible, and they can almost convince anyone that what is said in the Bible is not true. They can try and poke holes into it. And we say around here, if I can convince you into Jesus, then somebody else can convince you out of Jesus. But the thing that people need more than they need knowledge of Jesus is they need a personal experience with Jesus. And when I think about all these empty chairs in the room, when I think about all, all the people that, that I hear in the pediatric ward, I think about all the people that they need a personal encounter with Jesus. And so I want to ask you this question. I want, I want to ask you, what about your empty chair? What about the empty chair next to you in here? What about the empty chair in your life? What about the empty chair in your family? What about the empty chair at work? Or, most importantly, what about this empty chair in your heart? See, what this empty chair is, is it's an opportunity that needs Jesus. And see, we're up against the world, and everything that the world wants to throw at us. That's why in a city of 5 million people, a church celebrates because they get 180 people to sit in an auditorium. Now, I'm thankful for every single person that sits in here, but you know what? My work's not done, and the work of this church is not done, and we're not going to sit back on our heels and say that the work of Jesus is done, because it's not. Because somewhere, somebody, including you, you need an encounter with the resurrected Jesus. You know, when I think about our son who's in high school, and this is the last thing I'll say, and then I'll, we'll bring the band up. But when I think about our son that's in high school, he's at, at Rondebosch, I see that these kids have, have almost no representation of Christ at their school. And that's the same at Saks. It's the same at Pinelands High. It's the same at, at, at the girls' schools. It's the same everywhere. People just, there's no, there's no representation of Jesus there. And I just see that, that there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of kids that are going to be the next generation of this church. They're going to be the ones that either sit in that empty chair or create another empty chair because they don't come. And the thing that they need more than anything is they don't need convinced they need a personal encounter with Jesus. You know, it's interesting at Rondebosch, they ran an alpha course. 
And Alpha, especially Alpha Youth, it's amazing. I'm not knocking it at all. But you know how many conversions came out of that? Zero. You know why? Because the world is desperate for a real personal encounter with Jesus. And so I want you to think about your life in that way. What, what do you need in your life to have a personal encounter with the resurrected Jesus? See, th- this whole thing would, this whole thing that we have here is a gift to us because Jesus resurrected. I know I keep saying that over and over and over again, but it's something that it needs to be pounded into our heads. So what about your life would be different because of the truth of the resurrection? That's the question that I want you to think about when we enter into this time of worship here. What in your life would be different because of the truth of the resurrection? Peter, because of the truth of the resurrection, Peter's life, his entire life changed dramatically and drastically. And the same resurrection that impacted Peter is the same resurrection that can impact you. The same truth about a risen Lord is the same truth about a risen Lord for you. And the same thing that we believe about Jesus when he rose from the cross or when he rose from the grave, we believe that that same truth is here for us and it's here for our community. And so I want you to know that I believe that there are things in your life that could be different because of the truth of the resurrection. And that truth of the resurrection is that God loves you so much that he sent his one and only son so that those of you who believe in him will have eternal and everlasting life. And so if there's any part of you that's ready for life change, it can happen through this right here, through letting the resurrection of Jesus impact your life. So I'm going to pray for us.